we're at the Smith Appleby house and we're putting the pie in the Dutch oven. The Dutch oven is already hot. It's been on the fire for quite a while and it's going to go on top of the coals or the coals are going on top of it, I see. Both ways, both ways. And Peter Giamarco is taking the coals out of the hearth. He is a volunteer here who has many culinary skills, has just been picking dill and parsley and describing how all these were used, these herbs were used. But here we put the Dutch oven on top of the coals and now we put the coals on top of the Dutch oven. And we are ready to cook the pie, to warm the pie. I guess it was already cooked, but this would have been how it was cooked as well. And now it's getting browned. So thank you, Peter. We're here at the Smith Appleby House, a very hospitable place if you want to come visit. We are very happy to be here in Smithfield with the Historical Society here. But it's also a place where a lot of research is done so that they can find out what our ancestors were doing here in Rhode Island. Um, this house has many lives. The, the rafters and the walls tell the story. It has many doors because the road was changed, there's a river nearby, and all of the things that happened to this house has shown how endurance goes through history and brings us history when we come to visit. So today, um, Maggie Botello is going to show us around, and Kathy Yandemis is going to be helping us and Peter Giamarco is also going to be helping us. So we're going to have experts showing us through the house. Welcome to Good News Rhode Island. So before we start this tour of this wonderful house, I'm going to talk to Maggie Patello about what's going on here and what we're looking at as we see it. Um, Kathy and Peter are smoking or just sitting quietly by the fire as we talk. So Maggie, you've been a volunteer here, so you've been researching this place for a long time. And you know some of the beginnings of it. I think this is the room that where it began. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. Yes, Juliana. So the room that we're in right now is called the keeping room. And I think we call it that just because that's where the main fire was always kept. So this was a, the original house. So the original house was one room, a stone ender, would have had a room above and perhaps a small loft above that. So the house uh, contained the, the family at the time, Elisha Smith and his wife Experience. She was Experience Maori. They had 10 children. She had experience. She had experience. So those 10 children would have all been uh, living, learning, being fed, clothes being washed over the hearth uh, for all of those years until they started adding on. Elisha Smith was the grandson of John Smith, who was known as the Miller, who came with Roger Williams from the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So when Roger Williams was being you know, potentially banished, John Smith determined to come with him and settled in Providence with Roger Williams. That's very interesting. So. The reason they were here was they were fleeing in a way, is that right? Right. I mean, Roger Williams had made such a wonderful relationship with the, the native population that he was welcomed here, and then the men that followed with him because they, they treated um, the, those Native Americans um, as people. They didn't take things, they bought things. So the real reason I think that Elisha came all the way out here to the Outlands was because Providence was growing so quickly. They had upwards of a population of 2,000 people. In 16? Oh. 69 or whatever? 1696. 96. But that's, so the, the whole idea I think of um, land ownership was very important. That was the real, that was the real wealth. So as uh, John Smith, uh, his, his son uh, acquired land, and then Elisha acquired land, 
uh, coming out to the outlands where it was less crowded was um, considered the appropriate thing to do because then they as uh, young men and women starting out could start acquiring that land themselves. Elisha had upwards of 700 acres at one time. Mm. So that's almost all of Smithfield, I assume. Um, well, Smithfield was much bigger, included parts of Lincoln mm. and Cumberland, and I think North Smithfield as well. So this house would have been a lonely house along a road with the river. He would have used the river for transporting I don't know if the river was used to, to move goods or anything like that. Um, I mean, Elisha had both a grist mill and or a sawmill at one point in time. So the power from the Wanasquatucket River was harnessed. Um, there's a dam outside. Perhaps when you go out and do a little filming outside, you'll be able to, to, to see where that dam was. And um, the Rhode Island soil is not very kind. I, I don't know, there, there probably is good places to grow potatoes. I don't think it was on this land. So Elisha, I think, made a lot of his money through the mills. Um, and then they also raised cattle. Uh, they would have probably uh, raised all of their own um, animals so that they would be able to have their meat for the winter. Um, they were cutting wood. I mean, everything was heated by wood. You, you used your wood for uh, providing heat, light, warmth for uh, the smoke that would go up into the smoke closet to cure your meats. So, I mean, their, their life was probably very involved with just the sustenance things. Mm -hmm. And luckily to be so close uh, to, the, to the river that they would have access to water and wood and deer and, you know, mm -hmm. so many of the things. And the native peoples who were here, what, who were they? I believe probably um, Nipmuc was probably one of, one of the predominant ones. Um, I mean, here on the East Coast, in Abenaki, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert on that. So, um, okay. But I mean, if you would imagine, you know, when they were settling here, and, and experience in Elisha, it was only about 20 or some years after King Philip's War. Mm -hmm. So for, you were talking about being on a lonely road, Yes, it was probably very isolating. Um, they were probably still in the back of their minds, you know, concerns about that. They educated their children here as well because there was no school. The children had no one else to play with. I just want to set the scene for this room, which holds, has, holds so much life and so much history. You can see the beams. You can see uh, the fireplace and what an important part it would have been. I'm sitting here this far from the fireplace, but I can certainly feel it. It's warming the house on a chilly day. So uh, now it's time for us to go around and see a little bit more of the house. We're going to go to the buttery now, and Maggie's in there. I'm not going to go in, but she's going to tell us, gee, is this where you kept all the butter? Actually, Juliana, the, the buttery was so called because of the butt kegs that were stored. So it, essentially a modern-day pantry, but the butt kegs, that's when George Washington, for instance, ordered Madeira wines or dried things that were coming from England, they would be shipped in a butt keg. So your butler was the person that would serve the alcohol from that butt keg. So this little buttery, um, although we do have some butter churns in this room, was so named for the kegs. So in here we have a lot of pewter pieces. Um, we have a lot of wonderful kitchen gadgets and choppers, platters. I think any, any modern woman would love to have something like this in her house for storing dishes and extra things. Uh, at one time the family sold vegetables right from this particular property uh, from this room itself. So there's actually a panel that would have been removed and that's where they would be um, selling some of the produce today that goes into another room. A historic and multi-purpose room, very tiny, probably, what, 6 by 13. Very interesting. Thank you. So you can tell there's no heat in here, so I have my coat on. Uh, but this is the gold parlor, and I can tell that it's a later room than the one we were just in. For one thing, it doesn't have exposed beams. Um, it is interesting that it has the windows that are um, 12 over 
9, 12 over 8, um, which is interesting configuration, I think. Anyway, this is the room where the fancy furniture was, probably where guests would be entertained. Um, probably in the middle to late 1800s. Yeah, very possibly. At one time, actually, this was also a bedchamber. I think, um, our, again, our modern thinking is that a room was ever used for one particular purpose, and that wasn't always the case. Mm -hmm. So uh, any one room could have been used for, for anything. And uh, at one time, there were two different families leaving here. One of the the um, the family line the, when the gentleman passed away he left half of the house to his daughter and the other half to his widow so that in other words making sure that the daughter shared the house with his 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 wife um, the that's a very clever convention I think that might I work think, I think so some of these mega dollar divorces settlements and, and, yeah. um, but you had comment about the uh, the ceiling so uh, at one point in time you know as this room was probably added during the 18th century maybe around you know 1780 or so uh, it might have had open beams at one time but when people modernize a home one of the things they do is they update the windows or they change a doorway or they put in accordion lath and plaster and all of a sudden, now you have a nice, bright, white ceiling. And I think it was a very modern look. This is painted with calcimine. That was a, a product that was made with lime. And it um, doesn't always agree with modern paint. So um, when we bring large groups of people, we always ask, please don't touch the ceiling. Because um, you know skin oils can damage the ceiling over time. And priests don't breathe, probably, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, so this is an added room, and it shows that houses breathe and move and change and take history and take family ups and downs, and um, they absorb them all. That's absolutely right. Just a, a couple of things in this room. Um, we have, a, a, a pro I think it's about an 1860 chapel organ, and um, this was recently restored and now plays beautifully. Um, there is also a kind of remarkable uh, sampler that's that's hanging on the wall. I don't know if we'd be able to get that later. Obviously, samplers were a way young ladies used to learn how to uh, do sewing. They learned how to do to create things, but also in some samplers, they were uh, learning their alphabet and their numbers. So that was part of their education. We're in a room that I would call a dining room. It's lovely with large, three large windows and a fireplace that has a fireplace screen on it right now for the summer. And a table, a, a dining table that's back against the wall because the table isn't kept in the middle of the room. But there's something really beautiful on the walls and uh, maybe you could tell us about it. Right. Maggie. Um, we refer to this as the stencil room for obvious reasons. Uh, there was a lot of stencil work done in the house. Um, when the restoration was being done, a lot of the, the, the whatever had been stenciled originally wasn't able to be recreated. But this was. So there is a panel in this room that was left unrestored. So in 1996, when this new stencil work was done by Deanna Gurton, she recreated what would have been the original stencil work that was done around 1809. Patience Harris uh, married a John Smith, and when she, it was probably John Smith Appleby, there's so many of the names are the same. So when Patience Harris was the new bride to the house, I think this was how she had an opportunity to make the house uniquely hers. So she had this particular pattern done. It was called a bell and swag, and if you note along the top of the stenciled wall where you see the small pegs that are showing, so those pegs were known as shaker pegs. And although the house, uh, the family itself, uh, they were universalists, the shaker pegs were a pretty common way of having places to hang things in your house. Not a lot, of, well really no closets, rather the use of blanket chests, etc. But at one time, the Smith Appleby House was a school for children. It was called a dame school. So young children would have come to the home of a lady that lived in the area, and they would have learned um, their letters and their numbers. 
And sometimes when I'm in this room, I can imagine um, small benches maybe where the children sat and small caps or bonnets or hats or cloaks being hung from all these small pegs in this room. We're in another parlor and it's a lovely room. Again, moved from that with the house that was moved here, I bet, because it's the same era, I think, as the one next door. Uh, but this is a parlor with a lovely sort of federal fireplace, I believe, and um, certainly made to last. Not a cooking stove, but a warming stove. Well, I guess it is. It has the, um, the what is that called? Crane. That long crane. A, a crane. crane. A crane to hold the pots. Anyway, why don't you tell us some things about this room? Well, the, um, this room it was actually a house. It was a house that was disassembled from a place in Johnston. I, it was alternately called either the Clements or the Clement House. So if a fire had destroyed part of the house, what they would do is uh, harvest the wood. So the wood would be saved and then it was reassembled here. So at the time, this would have basically doubled the size of the home. So this was added around 1730. So if lean-tos were the original addition to the house, then this was really the, the second largest addition. It has a couple of wonderful features. Juliana, you were just looking at the Parsons cupboards. So in the day, the church would come to the family. You wouldn't have... Uh, a big church. We did not have big churches in New England. We were just starting to have meeting houses with the Society of Friends. So if the parson would come to your home, there would be the good book, family Bible, and perhaps some libations to hurry him on his way. This room also has a couple of wonderful features that include a barrel cabinet. So the barrel cabinet front has the original wavy glass. It's made up of small curved boards that create a parabolic shape. When the barrel cabinet was added, it probably would have been added around the 1780, and because it has such a curious back to it, it would have sort of jutted out into the adjacent room. So what they did was create an 18th century china closet, and perhaps we could look at that uh, at some point. But the other interesting thing about this room is the flooring. Now this is just regular wood, but this wood has been painted to look like marble. So we call it a marbleized floor. This would also have been something that was done in 1809 when Patience Harris was the new bride to the house. And another little item in this room is actually a gentleman's top hat that's sitting on a table. This was a hat that was sold at auction when Myra Appleby passed away, the last of the seven generations of the family, then all of the effects in the house were sold at auction. So that house, that hat, um, which is a rubbed silk men's top hat, was, a, was just recently returned to the house for us. Um, <laughs> I'm looking out at the river, and you explained that the, there have been road changes and um, I guess even river changes, is that right or not? Well, the, the river, the Wenasquatucket River has always flown here in this spot. Um, at one time, Elisha Smith would have dammed the river in order to harness the power for his gristmill and sawmill. The road that originally ran along, it had to be moved when the Georgiaville Pond was created. And it was also in the mid-1860s, let's say. So it was a, a pond that was created to provide water for downstream mills when uh, there were drought years. But looking out now, as the water is allowed to be lowered in Georgiaville uh, Pond, and they do that every year, and that allows the folks that have docks that you know enjoy the water, uh, it gives them an opportunity to service their docks, et cetera. We're upstairs, and I'm looking at this huge loom, which takes a whole room which is a very vial, valuable commodity, both the loom and the room. <laughs> and so I want you to tell me, they must have woven their own clothes when they were that isolated. Right. Well, I think a box loom might not have had its own dedicated room. A box loom might have been up in an attic area. And it was typically the men that did the weaving, not the ladies. 
Um, but in this room, we have some Saxony-style wheels that were used for spinning both flax fibers as well as wool, and a walking wheel that was used for spinning wool. The box loom actually didn't didn't get a lot of use. Um, you know, as, as the 18th century was progressing, people were able to buy a lot of goods from England. So they didn't have to have this large piece in their home. Uh, once the American Revolution began, it was considered unpatriotic to be, be buying goods or even trying to obtain goods from England. So the box looms kind of came back out again, and women started, we, uh, you know, both spinning and weaving again so that they could make those homespun clothes. So yes, women and men were creating the cloth, um, they were growing the flax, uh, cotton was very expensive. This is before the, the invention of the cotton gin, before Eli Whitney's invented the cotton gin. Cotton was very expensive. So you had folks that were growing their own flax, they were cleaning it, they were uh, you know, bleaching it, um, running it through hackles in front of that one window. You can see uh, a series that looks like nails kind of sticking out. So you would run the flax fibers through those nails and it would straighten the fibers so you could start to do the spinning process. So when people used to say, don't get your hackles up, that's what they're talking about, meaning don't get prickly, <laughs> don't get sharp, because they were either called uh, hatchels, hatchels, or hackles. Very interesting. You were saying that uh, the wood had many uses, and one of the wo wood's uses was fo uh, smoke. And smoke is the way that they cured meats. And so they would hang a whole animal, it looks like, in there, or half an animal. Well, a p I think maybe more likely portions of animals. So for instance, if you were hanging ham, um, and other pieces of pork for bacon, for instance. And as you see inside the, that smoke closet, that dark, dark material is the actual creosote that's formed when smoke is sort of being held in that smoke closet. And the hooks on those walls are designed to hold those slabs or pieces of meat. And so not unusually, meat that was actually touching the creosote would bind with the creosote. So you would bring those pieces of meat down from your smoke closet, hang it on a hook in the kitchen, and then you'd be able to scrape off all of that, that creosote. But the smoke is preserving the meat by killing any bacteria. So as in the South, you would have a smoke closet or a smoke room outside in New England. We're saving all that warmth and heat by keeping it all inside the house. So a little unusual. I don't think we would ever think of having a smoky room inside of our house today. But it was very, very efficient and very, very practical. We're in another bedroom, and I understand this is a very special bed. Oh, um, the room we're in right now is the small bed chamber. And this is, of course, a rope bed. We have now three rope beds in, in the museum. Um, these were actually used in, basically in lieu of what we would consider a box spring today is a is just a, a roping that goes back and forth to create the support for a mattress. These mattresses would have been filled with down. Those were harvested from a goose while the goose was still living. It was the job for a little girl to harvest the feathers. I do believe the geese resented this process. It was typical to put a long stocking over the goose's head just to stop the little girl from being bitten <laughs> while the feathers were being extracted. This bed is also called a rolling pin bed. So the end of the, the bed actually lifts up so that a person on either end would be able to take the end and then roll it down the length of the bed and get all of the lumps out of the, the mattresses. So in the day, you know, sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. Sleep tight meant as your ropes loosened over time, you would use a wooden key to to tighten them, and of course, when you're dealing with straw or you're dealing with feathers, there's always the possibility of some small bugs getting into your bed at night. So the, the pictures that Julianne is holding are those of um, Myra Appleby as a younger woman, and uh, also a, a photograph of Myra and her lifelong companion, 
Her name was Abby Sargent. So when Myra started the golf course here, she had Abby as a, a help and a companion. And my understanding it was a nine-hole golf course that was eventually bought when 295 was put in. Myra came to live here on this property when she was about 16 and um, had some difficulties with some of her relatives at the time. She went out to make her fortune. She worked at the Coates factory making threads, etc., cetera, and uh, came back to the house full time when her father inherited the house. His name was Sidney Merton Appleby and then inherited the property from her father planting orchards and then eventually cutting down orchards to create the golf course. So Peter, you know a lot about this yard, this X 700 acres that's now seven. That's right. And uh, the work that you do here is, as a volunteer, is to take care of the garden and the plantings. And so I wondered if you could tell us if you know something about what was here, but what is here now. As well, well, this garden here, the small one, this was is the kitchen garden now, and it was the kitchen garden then. The, the footprint of this garden hasn't changed for hundreds of years. So wh when I'm planting, can I go over here a little bit? Yes. Okay. When, when I'm uh, planting, I'm trying to plant what they would have had in their kitchen garden. Uh, this year I had uh, two rows of carrots. Uh, you can see the wilted remains of uh, Swiss chard. We just had a very heavy frost the past couple of days. Um, a row of parsley over there, uh, and I had all, all the greens here uh, behind the fence so the little critters like the rabbits and such couldn't uh, have the free food. Uh, this, this is the herb garden pot of the kitchen garden. Uh, as you can see, we have two kinds of sage. Uh, we have a, a nice big rosemary bush, and there's assorted mints down here. There's lavender, a row of lavender. I just harvested the fennel just before you came. Um, and most, of, most of the herbs die back, the, the oregano has died back, uh, the, there's English thyme over there, but they'll be back next year. Um, uh, and as far as uh, the other garden down there, if you'll pardon the uh, chicken wire fence, that's not very period, but uh, we do have a lot of deer in the neighborhood and I try to keep them out of the corn. Uh, they most certainly had corn in colonial times, uh, and pumpkins and, and pole beans. Uh, those were called the Three Sisters, actually, by, by the Native Americans. Uh, but it, the corn it, wasn't eaten, was it? It was used for the you, cattle? You made meal uh, for bread. Ah, uh, uh-huh. You, you, uh, you ground You would it. grist it, right. Um, also here uh, in the spring, well, before spring, in February, uh, I tapped the maple trees oh. and make, make our own uh, maple, maple sugar. And uh, in the fall, with, with our 11 apple trees, uh, I press the apples for cider. So, and it's delicious cider because I had a really nice taste of it. And then you also cut the trees, the apples off the trees, and you put them I in I picked pies. the apples off the trees, yes. We, the, that apple pie that you saw was made with apples from these trees. Well, it's great that you're continuing the traditions. You're really... Um, what would I say? You're, you're caring so well for this house. Thank you very much, Peter, and to Maggie, and for all the work that you do to take care of this house. We thank you for watching Good News Rhode Island, and we're pretty sure that good news is right around the corner. And you know, the Smith Appleby house is not far away. So learn your history. Come here. Pete is going to reveal the pie at this point. He's picking up the lid to the Dutch oven that has coals on it, and he's finding the pie inside the very hot pan that was sitting on coals as well. So Pete's picking the pie up. There it is. You can put it on here. It looks beautiful.